you also from my part. I'm talking today about innovation and research in hydropower. And um, I will start first of all um, with um, some outcomes of Fit Hydro. Uh, and then I will go to um, uh, some research we have uh, basically made at the TUM and also some own thoughts about future of hydropower. You know that we had in Fit Hydro um, several developments and we developed valuable uh, solution methods, tools and devices. You saw some of them uh, yesterday and you will see others today. Uh, from the Fit Hydro project, we know that the effects of hydropower can be mitigated uh, on the fish uh, ecology and fish population. And um, we also know um, that some measures seem more or less promising uh, and cost effective. And uh, I think we can offer the community a set of useful methods, tools and devices for future use. But uh, of course, if you go into depth in a, in a topic, uh, then you begin to realize that there are gaps. And we have also seen gaps which we cannot cover at the moment and we couldn't cover to the free title project. And uh, also we see that, of course, um, not everything we seem uh, or which seems meaningful uh, is uh, used outside uh, from operators, uh, from planners. And the question is why? Probably sometimes it's a uh, lacking willingness. Sometimes it's just something new, which one doesn't know. And then there are also economic reasons. Now, um, from these uh, tools and uh, devices, uh, I uh, have a list here. I wouldn't go through that. Uh, some of them have already been treated yesterday and some I will treat in very short during uh, my presentation. So what uh, do I see for the future of hydropower? I see um, general trends towards uh, more flexibility and more dynamics. So it means uh, we have at the moment uh, very stiff regulations and I guess these should become more flexible because nature is dynamic. Uh, and we have to account for this uh, dynamics uh, of uh, natural system of the environment and we should be able to reproduce, reproduce it in our hydropower plants. We have a big lack of understanding fishes. So we actually know a little bit about it, but the research is, uh, I would say, more or less at the beginning. Uh, fishes are through evolution highly optimized, optimized uh, creatures. If we would better understand their evolutionary development and, and their behavior, which uh, arise from this development, we could build hydropower plants uh, which are much more fish friendly than they are today. And then I would see also for the future more eco environmental management, adaption and design of hydropower plants. So we don't have to necessarily optimize all technical equipment, but we could run adapt and design hydropower in an optimized way in order to reach certain goals, in our case of fit hydro fish, fish friendliness. Okay, so I'm talking about uh, operational flexibility uh, to overcome stiff regulation and stiff habits also. Uh, we should adaptively be operated, why? for sediment passage into the downstream to enable, for example, eel uh, or other fish species to migrate through an open weir, for example, into the downstream, if there is time for migration of eel, to perform reservoir flushing and such to improve fish habitat conditions. I also see that the dotation of fish passes should ad adapt in the future more to migrating fishes. For example, small fish, they need 
probably other stimuli and can only cope with lower flow velocities than large fish. We don't take uh, into account this at the moment. And uh, a big disadvantage, I would say, is uh, hydropower is currently completely optimized for economy. Uh, but in principle, we could optimize it in all direction. So it could be optimized for fish survival in turbines, for example. And we will see an example which has been uh, uh, done uh, during the Fit Hydro project. Or it could be optimized to guide fish through turbulence uh, created in the downstream to a fishway, for example. And I also will show you an example on that. Now, okay, let's talk about adaptive weir operation. Um, what you see here is um, actually a figure from the Rhine between uh, Lake of Constance and Basel, very close to Basel, actually. And you see the granulometry of the riverbed before and after a flood. So this is before the flood. You see very fine sediments after the flood very coarse sediment, coarse sediment, which are appropriate, for example, to graylings spawning here. And what you see on the right hand side, this is a suitability of fish habitats for graylings. And uh, you see different scenario and you see the changes in time. You see this first scenario, almost no suitability. Uh, the other ones, they have much higher suitability, but you also see suitability for fish habitat is not a constant over time. It's dynamically changing and we don't reproduce these dynamics in our operation. Okay, so this is an, uh, another example. Um, uh, for example, considering uh, flushing of reservoirs um, in order to optimize water levels, in order to change uh, bathymetry or granulometry. And uh, in principle, we could uh, run through a mathematical optimization project process to reach a goal we want to reach. You see here on the picture here, uh, the um, changes uh, of the flushing schemes. Uh, there is a flushing scheme in orange, which is the optimized proposed at the certain dam at the Saloch River in uh, Germany, Austria. And you see that we can very much influence not only water levels, which is of course uh, important for flood protection, but we can also uh, influence the riverbed, which could also be important for population. So there is some freedom, which we at the moment don't use, and we don't use it mainly because we have very stiff regulations from our authorities. Okay, now more flexibility and dynamics also in operation. What you see on the right hand side here, the pictures is, uh, these are two devices which have been investigated during the Fit Hydro project and which have been uh, developed uh, to a higher TRL level during the Fit Hydro project. It's on the right hand side, uh, the optic optical uh, 3D fish tracking al algorithm developed by ETH in Zurich. So you can observe fishes without uh, putting sensors in them. And you get tracks in 3D. And of course, from that, you can know much more for the future. How do fish behave? How do they react on currents? We at TUM, we have um, another system, an array of uh, ultrasonic uh, sensors and emitters. And um, we can use it also to position fish over quite a long distance uh, in, for example, the downstream of a hydropower plant. So I think in the future, our sensoriums allow us to see what happens inside the water body. So we see whether there will fish arrive at the hydropower plant and we can react on it. We can, we can optimize uh, the operation also in a sense for the environment. Okay, so uh, let's go to 
optimization uh, for uh, habitats and for e-flows. So e-flows uh, and reservoir outflows, they can and they should vary in time. Why? To achieve resilient habitats for a variety of different species. I mean, uh, not every species likes the same condition. That's just nature. Or, for example, to improve fish habitat conditions and remove colmatation, for example. But if you're talking about e-flows, then not only water flow is important, probably even as important or more important is river morphology. And uh, we should vary uh, also the flow in order to vary the morphology to offer optimal riverbed granulometry for different species and to involve force biodiversity by diverse flow, but also by diverse morphological conditions. What I show you here is an example from the uh, Ember project. Uh, it's my uh, friend and uh, colleague, uh, Piotr Parasiewicz, uh, who was very much involved in that, with uh, whom we also have a collaboration. And um, at the moment, um, we have very stiff regulations, often uh, for e-flow, or you might call it residual flows. and. Um, during the AMBER project, um, we got a map of different macro habitat types uh, in Europe. So this, the map, and this map shows um, macro habit which are similar, which have similar fish population. And uh, this, is a first um, step into e-flow. Similar, similar rivers, similar uh, boundary conditions, similar population should somehow result in a unified process in order to get um, environmental flows. But um, uh, the big advantage of the approach, uh, which I learned to know from Piotr, um, is that uh, in his uh, approach, hydrological conditions also include extreme events. And uh, if you look at the life history of native species, um, then uh, we know that uh, they are adapted to the natural dynamics uh, in their region and their river. And so extreme events uh, occur on the natural conditions. Native fauna is adapted and can withstand such events. And therefore, uh, one can analyze habitat availability on the natural condition. One can identify frequency, magnitude, and duration of extreme events on the natural conditions. And one can develop e-flow criteria which suit native uh, species. Now we're talking, we were talking about uh, mainly flows. Um, so we should uh, not only have e-flows, but we should go into the direction of e-sediment and the result could be e-habitats. So we could probably use similar approaches as um, used by the methodology I described to you for identification, frequency, magnitude, and duration of extreme hydrologic events and their effect on channel morphology. And uh, we could um, incorporate um, of such events into an e-flow scheme. And this would then consider also natural season for such event and sediment continuity of course in the catchment would be enforced uh, but um, I mean we can often not go back to natural condition in that sense of course. So uh, let's go to understanding of fishes. So fishes are um, perfectly uh, suited, uh, but we 
to the environment, to the flow condition, what they see in natural environment, but we don't understand it. And uh, one first step we uh, did undertake is uh, use um, CFD to compute an environment in a vertical slope path, for example. And then um, uh, using a software and an approach to try to model how do fish swim in such environments. So the movement of our uh, virtual fish are governed um, uh, by surrounding flow and by reaction of the fish to this uh, surrounding flow situation, which we can define in different uh, ways. We can define pattern of motion, but we can also try to use uh, more artificial intelligence. What I show you here is a video from uh, Laura uh, David uh, from Poitiers. Uh, and it is analyzed uh, with uh, fish tracks. You see the track down here. It's difficult to understand the video because we see the picture of uh, actually two mirrors, one from down to up and one from left to right. And so if we combine it, uh, we get uh, observed tracks in 3D. Now we can combine this uh, by um, uh, coupling the hydrodynamic dynamic to reinforced learning. So what is reinforcement learning? It's an area of machine learning that deals with how intelligent agents should perform actions in an environment to maximize cumulative rewards. So they get a reward if they uh, behave good, uh, a positive reward, a negative reward, vice versa. And um, the typical framework of such a reinforcement learning uh, scenario is an agent performs action in an environment that results in positive or negative rewards, and the agent improves and optimizes its reaction. So this is a comparison, uh, how, uh, where is a fish uh, in uh, time, where it is observed here, and where do we compute it here? So it's probably not optimum, but qualitatively not too bad. Uh, we think that one reason it's not optimum is also that we don't consider the dynamic uh, turbulent fluctuations. We just use a, a Reynolds averaged uh, turbulence model. Okay, now the last thing. Uh, more eco environmental management adaption and design. Um, so I think um, if we would understand fishes entirely, we would operate uh, hydropower plants in a fish friendly way. We could manage the environment in a way that suits the request of the fishes. We could adapt existing hydropower plants to suit better the needs and natural behavior of fishes. And um, we could design a new generation of hydropower plant. So uh, this is actually now one step away from considering only e economy. So this has been done by Uli Stolz uh, in our deliverable 3.3. And it shows you hill charts. It shows you hill charts in a turbine. Uh, what is uh, best uh, configuration related to pressure score, strike score, strain score, turbulent kinetic energy score, and the combined score, which I do not show here. And from thus, um, there is a, a hill chart related to fish friendliness or to ecology and not to economy. This is also a device which we investigated. It's a patent of TUM. The inventor is Franz Geiger. Uh, Peter, what, you have one minute left. Please. Okay, you see an electrode. With this electrode, electronic shock, you can divert fish in a way to the hub where it is subject to minor damages only. And you see, you get half of the strikes uh, you would usually get. Or you could operate a turbine in off-peak mode, completely change flow pattern, and then fish completely swim differently in the downstream. 
And of course, uh, this leads then to what you probably know, the Shaft hydropower plant, uh, which will be optimized in the Central Asia project. And I show you a one minute film at the very end of my presentation. Uh, what is the concept of this hydropower shaft power plant? And I would like to thank you. I would like all contribution from all partners. And uh, I would also like to thank on the last slide, the EU for financing our Fit Hydro project. Thank you. So you see the comparison of a classical hydropower plant. This is the shaft hydropower plant. You see how it functions. It's a very simple design. You see that sediment migrates into the downstream. There are very low velocities for fishes and we have a bypass in the vicinity of the turbine intake, which is of course important. You see two openings and upstream is the same. Okay, and with that I close and thanks.